horrendous temperatures. You are, you are brave souls, that's what you are. Uh, to begin with, since we have some people in the audience for whom this is an unfamiliar art form, what exactly is an art song? Very simply, it is a poem set to music. No scenery, no costumes, one singer, one piano, and between these two people, using all the artistry they possess, they have to tell you a different story every three or four minutes. That's the challenge, and that's the magic, and that's why we love it. Tonight, we have four amazing artists for you, tenor John Matthew Myers and soprano Christine Lyons, who will be accompanied by truly the esteemed pianists Laura Ward and Mario Antonio Mara. So, let's see where these people can take you tonight. The French language has often been described as verbal music. It has flow, it has grace, it has balance. Just as our speech flows from our thoughts, French art song is characterized by music composed around the natural accents of speech. Our second composer, Claude Debussy, once said, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, you must forget you are singers. The music is at the service of the words. Christine is going to sing four songs about a favorite subject of the French, and what do you think that is? Love, of course. Each poem is related in some way to nature's. The first, lovers walking in the woods. Second, resting together in the woods. The third, comparing the dawn and the dusk to the rise and fall of love. And the last one is about a cicada. Now you might ask yourself, what in the world does this have to do with love? But the composer is saying that the cicada is a glorious little insect and that the beauty of his song, the strength of his song, represents everything that is glorious about nature and how immensely fortunate we are to live among this French art song.
What I said was, what a gorgeous instrument, isn't it? Right, yes. So, falling in love, what's it like? Remember? Or are you there now? Disturbing, to say the very least. Infatuated, imprisoned by passion, burning with ardor, and all that stuff. 
But if the object of your affection is someone you cannot have, then you can add pain and despair to that list. And this is our singer in the next song. The poet Petrarch was in love with the beautiful Laura de Noves. He saw her once in church, and that was it. But she was married and therefore unattainable forever. In this song, Patri non trovo, I can find no peace. There are moments of calm and resignation, but they are interspersed with soaring climaxes of intense agitation. This poor lover is obviously in torment, and tenors do torment so well. I believe this song has one of the most beautiful piano introductions I've ever heard. And one might expect that because Franz Liszt was among the most brilliant pianists of his day. This introduction and the rest of the song shows you that the piano is a full partner in this art song endeavor. The pianist says with his hands exactly what the singer says with his voice. Pace non trovo.
I told Antonio before we went on, I said, this, this piano part is my favorite, so you had better have it gorgeous and rubato. And he said, I'm Italian, of course I will. <laughs> it's a sad fact that a composer, even if he is brilliant and considered successful during his lifetime, may not be counted among the great composers of his time, simply because what he has to say is not especially new. Such was the case, to some extent, with Joseph Marx. His songs are beautifully melodious, complex harmonically, and devilishly difficult to play. They're wonderful songs, but at the height of his career, there was a new kind of music coming up which involved atonality, dissonant and appealing, I think more to the intellect than to the heart. Marx was adamantly convinced that tonality was what music was all about, and he did everything to discourage and dissuade and put down the composers of this new type of music. He maintained that the essential purpose of music was not to disturb the listener, but to give them pleasure. He was a happy composer in a time when happiness was considered to be a bit trite. You will hear in these three songs a great deal of beauty, contentment, peace, and even when sadness comes, it is at the contemplation of something beautiful that was lost.
Charles Griffiths might have become one of the greatest composers, American composers of the first half of the 20th century, had he not died of the flu at the age of 35. He composed in a time period when multiple musical styles were vying for prominence. And it seems in his short life that he tried most of them at one time or another. The German Romantic tradition, the Impressionism, he developed a fondness for music of the Orient, and he even tried his hand at composing music based on American Indian tunes, and finally, atonality. All of this in 13 years of composing. Think what might have happened had he lived longer. It was his interest in the world of Celtic poetry that prompted him to write three songs on the poetry of Fiona MacLeod. However, the truth of the matter is that Fiona MacLeod did not exist. That was a pseudonym thought up by the Scottish poet William Sharp, who thought that perhaps his Celtic poetry would be more popular if the author of it was more ethnically appropriate. Kind of interesting that there were many women at that time who were writing under male pseudonyms simply to get published, and William Sharp did exactly the opposite. He included a sentence at the beginning of the manuscript for the song, The Rose of the Night. There is an old mystical legend that when a soul among the dead woos a soul among the living so that both may be reborn as one, the sign is a dark rose or a rose in flame in the heart of the night. Beautiful. this crying that I hear in the wind? Is it the old sorrow or the old grief? Or is it a
heard but a whisper, but a last echo.
since it is supposed to go down to um, what? Minus 15 degrees wind chill tomorrow, we thought it would not be inappropriate to do some songs about winter. We are so fortunate to have so many wonderfully skilled composers of American art song, and Christine is going to sing you four of the best. Each composer has taken elements of 20th century music and turned it into his own style. You're going to hear everything from classical art song to jazz. And this brings us to the last group that you will hear. Can a popular song be an art song? Absolutely. If a composer sets it a certain way and the singer adheres to that music, basically. John is going to present two examples by composers who brilliantly rode that line between art song and popular song, Kurt Weill and George Gershwin. Before I leave you, I simply want to thank you so very much again for coming out on this dreadful, dreadful night. I hope we have warmed your heart, and I hope that what you have heard tonight will make you want to hear more art song. Vocal Arts DC presents world-class singers in the Terrace Theater, about 500 feet above your head. Please go to our website, vocalartsdc.org, to see what treasures the rest of our season holds. And I want to wish you all a wonderful 2018, and may it include beautiful music. Thank you. Oh, no.
Icicles hang by the wall, and Dick the shepherd blows his name. When Tom bears lies into the wall, and milk comes frozen home in pain. When blood is in my boots, and ways we fall, then nightly sings the staring old. To walk, to whip, to walk. It's always been a pleasure to dedicate a measure to the lady who intrigued me at the time. Diana and Rosanna and Lana and Susanna were names I sang in rhythm and in rhyme. Cornelia and Aurelia Cecilia and Ophelia inspired lovely lyrics from my pen. But Angela is something else again. I can find a rhyme for Lucy. For instance, her kiss is juicy. But I must confess, I'm lost more or less with Angela. Angela, I can find a rhyme for Chloe. For instance, her breast is snowy. But rhyming is lame. When 
when you get a name like Angela. Angela, if only her name were Olivia, she could be a cute bit of trivia. If she were called Maria, or even Dorothea, she'd be my sole mia divine. I can find the rhyme for Irma. She's having on terra firma, but Angela has no patter. And yet, what does it matter? If Angela's heart rhymes with mine. I comprehend the world and all its papers and how it all will end. Nothing seems to be lasting, but that isn't our affair. We've got something permanent, I mean in the way.
Thank you for joining us at Millennium.